Valley Creek students, and welcome to Student Circles, where we've been unpacking our message series, Yahweh, the Lord your God. And we've been taking time to talk all about who God is and what He's like. And last week we got to go through part one of God is Good, and we pressed pause and left you with some questions to think about during the week. Like, do you really think that God is good? Do you believe that God is good? Is there evidence in your life that shows and supports that you live like God is good? Where do you question the goodness of God and what is that costing you in your life? See, sometimes we've got to take things and think about them. We've got to repent, change our mind for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Change your mind because the goodness of God is in reach of you. So Holy Spirit, we invite you in. Will you open our minds and open our hearts to be able to grasp the vastness of God's goodness in our lives? Let's check this out. Now, this is a lot. Just track with me. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, the Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh, the compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation. This is God defining his goodness. He says, I will show you my glory, which is my goodness, and I will proclaim my name in your presence. In other words, this is God proclaiming his name telling us exactly who he is and defining his character, his nature, and what his goodness actually looks like. See, we can say God is good all day long and all have a different definition of the word good. This is God defining his goodness for us. And what's fascinating is this is probably one of the most often repeated phrases, statements, truths all throughout scripture. If you would commit this to memory or you'd just be aware of it, as you're reading through the Bible, you'd be shocked how many times the Bible quotes the Bible on this one in particular verse. Why? Because it is who God is. So it uses it over and over again so we don't forget who he tells us he is. So will you walk with me through this? Okay, it's a little different. Just let's just break it down. Ready? The Lord, the Lord, Yahweh, Yahweh. We've said all throughout the series, the name of God brings with it all the reality of God. That God's name is his personhood. It's his presence. It's his power. It's his character. It's his nature. And when we declare his name, it brings with it all the reality. So when we say the Lord or Yahweh, it brings all the goodness of God into the moment. And the reason it's the Lord, the Lord is in Hebrew, they would write it twice as a way of emphasizing it. It would be like you or I, if we were sending a text message and you put it in all caps or in bold, it's like the Lord, not like the Lord, the Lord, no, the Lord, the compassionate God. Compassion is a feeling word. It's an emotion. It means God has heart for you. He sees your misery, he hears your cries, and he is concerned of your suffering. I mean, one of the names of God is that you are the God who sees me. You remember the story of the leper? A guy with an incurable, contagious disease. This disease has shut him off from, from his friends, from his family, from life itself. And he hits his knees in front of Jesus and cries out, if you are willing, you can make me clean. And it says, filled with compassion. Jesus' heart goes out to the man and says, I am willing and touches him. He's a compassionate God, which means he sees your anxiety. He sees your depression. He cares about that marriage you feel trapped in. He sees the bullying. He knows the thoughts you think at night when you're all by yourself. He is concerned about the loneliness. Like, like, he, is, he sees your misery. He's concerned of your suffering. He sees your misery. He is filled with compassion. And so he has come. He is the compassionate and gracious God. If compassion is a feeling word, grace is an action word. 
Grace is God acting in your life to do for you what you could never do for yourself. The problem for us is we have taken grace and we've brought it down to, we just think it's the forgiveness of sins. Yes, it includes forgiveness of sins, but it is undeserved favor and supernatural empowerment. Grace is God acting in your life, moving in your life, doing things in your life that you could never do for yourself. This is why it says the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus. It's God acting in your life to do what you could never do. I mean, do you remember the story when Paul has the thorn in the flesh? Some kind of problem in his life. We don't know exactly what it is, but he cries out to God and God says, Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in your weakness. When you are weak, I make you strong. Grace is God acting in your life and it is always sufficient for any and everything you face. No matter how weak you are, God's grace acts and moves in your life to make you strong. I mean, you remember the story of the prodigal son? The guy wishes his father dead, trashes his father, trashes his family, takes his inheritance, goes out into the world, trashes his inheritance, trashes his life, ends up in a pig pen and realizes maybe I can go back home. And he puts together this sorry, sad little repentance speech and he makes one little move towards repentance and it says the father filled with compassion saw his son coming a long way off and ran to him, feeling and action, grabbed his son, says, my son has come home, hugs him, gives him a robe, a ring, a sandals, and throws a party for him, restores his identity, reconciles his relationship, redeems his purpose, does for the son what the son could never do for himself in a thousand lifetimes. That's grace. It's God acting in your life to do for you that which you cannot do for yourself. And it empowers you to say no to godliness and unworldly living and passions in this world and live a self-right, controlled, upright, godly life in this age. He is the compassionate and gracious God. There are no other Elohims like him. And he's slow to anger. Now, remember, this is God defining his goodness to us. So let's talk about that for a second. Slow to anger. We don't really know what to do with that when we talk about God, do we? Some of you, you're convinced God's always angry. And some of you think God never gets angry. Okay, but let's just let God tell us who God is. Slow to anger. Which means he's patient and he's long-suffering. It means he can get angry, but you have to work really hard to get him angry. See, we don't understand anger because the extent of the anger we understand is worldly, human, fleshly, sinful, reactive anger. When that's when we think of anger, we think about it from a sin, fleshly perspective. We don't understand righteous anger. But if God is good, then all of his anger comes out of his goodness. So it's actually good anger. And God doesn't get angry every time his will is violated. There's 8 billion people on the earth who most of the time don't do his will. Do you imagine if he got angry every time his will got violated, the way we get angry every time our will was violated? There is no fit of rage with God. There's no just like, but that's what we think, isn't it? God's anger is directed at anything that interferes with his love for you. Think of Jesus. And when he turns over the tables in the temple, Jesus has been in the temple thousands of times before that. Why didn't he turn over the temples on all or the tables on all of those other times? Because he's slow to anger. But on that day, he said, enough is enough. And my anger is now directed at things that are interfering with my love for people. And he abounds in love abounds, overflows, a good measure, pressed down, running together, spilling over in love. How deep, how wide, how long, how high is the love of God? See, again, we don't understand love because what we think of as love is emotion and feeling. We think of mushy, gushy, ooey, gooey. But love in the Bible is goodwill. That's what it actually means. It's the word charity. It means to have good will. It means my will towards you is good and I will seek your good with everything I have. All my gifts and 
passions and talents and resources and time. If he is slow to anger, he's quick to forgive. We don't have to beg or plead or coerce or do a dance or do some kind of special religious ceremony. He's a forgiving God. And it says wickedness, rebellion, and sin. Why? Because they're three different things. Wickedness is the word iniquity. It means bent or propensity. It means you have a heart to do evil. You desire evil and you delight in evil. That's wickedness. It's iniquity. The word rebellion is the word transgression. It's where we get the word trespass. Rebellion is I know what God has asked me to do and I choose not to do it. And I know what God has asked me not to do and I choose to do it. It's very clear. I know what I'm supposed to or not supposed to do and I choose to do the opposite. It's like going up to a fence that has a big no trespassing sign on it and choosing to read it and jump right over the fence and keep going. That's rebellion. And sin is like an archer shooting at a target, missing the mark. Sin just literally means you've missed the mark of what you were created for or what you should have done in that moment. And the reason it says all three of these is because it's like God's way of saying, I am a forgiving God. As far as the east is from the west, so far have your sins been removed from you. I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. He literally says, like, blessed is the man whose, whose transgressions the Lord does not remember, whose sins are covered over with you, Lord. If you kept a record of wrongs, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness. And yet he does not leave the guilty unpunished. He punishes the children and their children for the sin of their fathers to the third and fourth generation. You're like, what does that mean? Well, let's just start here. He does not leave the guilty unpunished. Pause. That just simply means that God is just. It means that he will make wrong things right. And we crave justice, don't we? We have a whole generation right now rising up. And what they want more than anything is justice. We long for justice. And justice is good. Justice is making wrong things right. And if God didn't make wrong things right, he couldn't be good. And if he wasn't good, he wouldn't have the ability to make wrong things right. Because he is good, he has to be just. And because he is just, he is good. If I'm good and I don't make wrong things right, I'm no longer good by definition. And I don't have the ability to make wrong things right. If I'm not good, I will just make wrong things more wrong. This is why it says that the throne, the foundation of the throne of God is righteousness and justice, goodness and justice. Because he's good, he is just. And because he's just, it means he is good. This is your God. Behold your God in a way that he defines himself to us. You can see it in the garden when Adam and Eve sinned. You can see it in the life of Jesus. This is your God. And he passed in front of Moses proclaiming, how many times does the goodness of God pass through your life and get proclaimed in your life and you don't see it and hear it? Moses had eyes to see and ears to hear. How many times does God's goodness move right through your life? Is declared right in your, like this moment right now is God's goodness. He's literally passing through. Can you see him? He's literally proclaiming, can you hear him? He's literally saying in me, there is nothing to fear because I am good and everything I do is good and it all flows out of my goodness. And even in the worst of things, I'm working them together for the good of those who want me in their life. And after that, Moses bowed down to the ground at once and worshiped. Here's the honest question for you. Anywhere in this series, have you been humbled, broken, overwhelmed by the awe and wonder of God? If you've just come to church like every other week for the last two months and there's been no, whew, I am. He is. Yahweh. That would be something to cry out to the Lord for and say, God, I must be missing something because nothing in me is moving. 
When Moses came down from Mount Sinai, he was not aware that his face was radiant because he had spoken with the Lord. When Aaron and all the Israelites saw Moses, his face was radiant and they were afraid to come near. He sees the goodness of God and the goodness of God reflects off of his face. He sees the goodness of God and he glows with the glory of God. He radiates God's goodness. You want to know the number one way you can know if you're seeing the goodness of God? It radiates off your face. Countenance. And you can't fake it. Other people see it and it either stresses them out or it draws them in. (laughs) But you can't fake countenance. How can I not reflect the Lord's glory when I'm actually seeing it? In fact, you say that's Old Testament. Here's New Testament. And we with unveiled faces all reflect the Lord's glory, goodness, are being transformed into his likeness with ever increasing glory. Listen, Moses would see God and he would radiate with glory and then it would fade away until he'd come see him again. We now have Jesus, the hope of glory living inside of us, and we have ever increasing glory. So our faces don't get dimmer and dimmer. Our faces are supposed to get brighter and brighter and brighter with the glory and the goodness of the Lord. You know whose faces you can see it easiest on? Little children and praying grandmas. You want to see a face radiate with the glory of God, find someone in our church who's a disciple. And today when they go pick up their five-year-old, go just look at the five-year-old's face. They just believe that God is good. Jesus has forgiven me. I am loved mommy and everything is possible. (laughs) See it. And then praying grandmas. Have you ever seen my mom? Have you ever seen Miss Irma? I'm, I met a praying grandma two weeks ago after service. She was beautiful. She radiated the glory of God because they believe God is good. And Jesus has forgiven me. And I am love. You ever hear Ms. Irma say, I am loved and everything is possible. You know who you see it on the least students and young adults who are trying to live like the world. Middle-aged moms who are bitter and grumble and complain about their station in life and middle-aged men who love money and are enslaved to their jobs. All three of those groups can be believers, but there ain't no glory on their face. Why? Because they're not looking at the goodness of God. They're looking at the badness of the world. What does your face radiate? Stress, anxiety, anger, a fit of rage, fear, worry, guilt. Look to the Lord. He's in you and he radiates out of you. So what does your face radiate? To answer that question, you have to identify what you're beholding or what you're focusing on. So are you fixing your thoughts on Jesus? Are you letting him show you how good God is and how good he is to you? See, God is passing in front of you. So will you have eyes to see and ears to hear what he is showing you in this season? Let's turn to our tables now and talk about it.